tie is just around the bend. And it can become somewhat challenging. I don't preach on politics, but I think generally most people had preferred that we, we had a better situation in this last debate. Um, we care deeply for our country, we love our country, and I think it's that deep love that stirs us to push forward, to be kinder. But when your two presidential campaigns are talking about golfing, it's time to think differently. <laughs> it's time to think differently. We think of it as a story, I find it fascinating as I was praying and thinking about our country, and I was reflecting on everything going on. I was thinking about the woman that got healed, because that's the scripture of this week. And in this story of the woman that got healed, who endured much suffering, what does he tell that particular woman? Does he tell her to go volunteer at the rummage sale? No! Does he tell her to go run for president? No! Does he tell her to go in peace? Yes. Peace isn't a bad thing. Taking a break is a good thing. In fact, it is part of our DNA as Christians. Sabbath, rest, and renewal. And I do think there is this bit of sadness um, where we don't revere our elders and we don't sit and listen and from their wisdom. I think there is a sadness that kids don't run around houses and the mom is frustrated, and the dad is tired, and the grandpa says, come here, I'll tell you all a story. I'll tell you a story. Because we all have something to give, but it doesn't mean we're meant to give full throttle for the entire ride, does it? No. There will be people that will endure much suffering, that have paid their dues in life, and God says to them, Go in peace. But it's a little bit different in Jairus' situation, right? So in Jairus' situation, when his daughter is ill, he says what to this particular family? Feed her. She's hungry. See, it's tricky to be a Christian because it can be this murky path where there's no right or wrong. There's no, if I do this, I'm a great Christian, or if I do that, because it's fluid, it's living. What might be right for someone who has been healed may not be right for another. And it's a challenge and it's a balance. It takes time and thought and discernment. Time to reflect. Today is... One that we talked about setting aside, um, it's our Disability Ministry Day. And there's a special number, and you can look that up, and many of you um, seasoned Methodists know all about um, those advanced members. And I have a big heart for Disability Sunday because it reminds us of our job to bring people in like Jesus did. He didn't just heal, and this is where John gets it right, with the woman in particular who touched him, we have to remember that she would have been a woman outside of regular society. She would have been a woman not allowed in the house. She would have been a woman that was tossed aside. She wasn't preaching in the synagogue, and she wasn't singing in the streets. She was hurting. She was probably anemic. She had low energy. She had very little she would have been the one forgotten, the one no one talked to, the one people hoped wouldn't look at them. She was on the fringe of society, and she had no money. And when she touches the cloak, when she holds on, she had heard these miracles. She knew it would have been wrong in her culture to ask a holy man to touch her. She knew that. She wasn't stupid. And she takes it upon herself, just, just maybe this one last hope, this one last venture, and she touches his cloak, and she's healed. Now, I think Jesus had a choice. Jesus, he could have just walked away, right? Let her go on her merry way. Jesus could have made that choice, but he didn't. He had more work to do for this woman. 
He knew someone had touched him and got healed. He knew his power had left. And I want to stop there for a second because if there's ever been a time in your life you've prayed to God and you've prayed to God and you may or may not have experienced a miracle, God knows either way, right? Even in the crowd, God knew when somebody was praying for help. So she touches him, and she's healed, and she's hiding because she's not allowed to touch men, let alone the frim of her jacket. She was an outcast. She could have been an AIDS victim or anything where we put, don't touch, don't touch. And she touches the side of his cliff, and she's healed, and rather than just going off into the darkness, Jesus isn't afraid of his reputation. He doesn't, he doesn't care. What he cares for is the woman that was so desperate she needed that love. And so Jesus calls her out, who has touched my cloak? And the ones helping him, his, his leaders, his church leaders, his disciples, they laugh at him. How could you tell somebody touched your cloak? How do you know? He says, I know. I know my flock. And again, Jesus knows you. And he holds firm. He said what he said, and he makes no apologies. And the woman comes forward in tears, probably embarrassed, upset. She could be killed. Those were the laws. And Jesus says, you're healed. So here was this man of great holiness, power, whether or not you thought of him as the Messiah or not. Here was this person who had done this great thing, well known in society, and he points out to the outcast, and he says, you're healed. She stopped bleeding. She's good to go. Go in peace. The ball was then back in the society's court. She was good to be connected back with the community. But would the community accept her? We don't know, right? We don't know. But what we do know is that Jesus loved her, called upon her, and made her whole. And when you've suffered enough or you've lived a long life, let me say this again, you deserve a retirement. Everybody does. Everybody deserves Sabbath and time of renewal. I still am a firm believer that even if you're retired, there's still work for you to do. Maybe calling people is your ministry, maybe writing cards. You still have work to do, but that work changes. And it fits the season of your life. Now we come to Jairus. Now Jairus is a little bit different, right? Jairus isn't cast away on the outside of the society. He, he doesn't relate so much to the person with disabilities who has a hard time making it into church. Jairus is a little different. Jairus would have been your leaders, your big honchos. Um, he's the one that approves marriages, that approves sales, looks at things, gives his blessing or not gives his blessing, helps people rise to power or break down to power. Now, Jairus feels a little bit like Job. We talked last week about Job. What did Job's friends tell him? Get over it. You did something wrong, blah, blah, blah. What did Jairus' friends tell him? Don't bother. She's dead. Sometimes friends who mean well say the wrong thing. We talked about that, too. And we're human, and we sometimes get away with ourselves. But Jairus would have been a leader. But I wonder if he's not totally like Job. Maybe his friends were embarrassed that he was going to Jesus. Because remind me, which group of people plotted to kill Jesus? The Pharisees, right? Jairus had to go against his own group of friends, his own connection. It would have been political suicide. It would have been devastating. I cannot believe he went to that guy. Jairus did all of this not to save his eldest son, which would have made sense for the culture. Jairus 
went against his own people to save his daughter, someone with no to little rights in that culture. When Jairus went to Jesus and publicly embarrassed himself, did what the church didn't want him to do, to save this girl, which, let's face it, they're a dime a dozen. Jairus does this from a place of love. And Jesus welcomes her. He says, feed that child. Don't treat her like a dead thing. Feed that child. I think that it's easy for us to forget that there are people who feel inside and outside a group that need love and connection. My prayer throughout whatever happens in these elections, whatever happens in our church, is that we continue to love our neighbor. That we continue to make ourselves vulnerable and bring people in, like the way Jesus taught us to. That we forget the ways of the world, and we don't outcast people simply because they have a disability, and we don't outcast people because they've been living on the streets, and we don't outcast people because they have cancer or AIDS or anything like that. We remember what is our job, and we do it in peace, and we do it appropriately for every season. We do our job. Does what the rest of the world mean we stop doing our job? No, oh, we hold firm to our beliefs. And we've had a great teacher with an abundance of love and understanding and reason. We might find ourselves sometimes on the outside of a group having to walk into a group to talk and ask for love or to ask for help. We might find ourselves having to stand up to those within our group. Jairus was part of the group that gossiped behind Jesus' back, that made up arguments, falsities. They were the kind that said terrible things when Jesus wasn't in the room. And yet he chose his daughter. I hope that we too can be brave. Choose love. Choose acceptance. Choose kindness. They say it takes on average. So as you know, annual conference just happened. And they pointed me to my third year here in the church. But the tricky thing is, <laughs> this is the tricky thing is, I don't know if you know this, they say it on average through psychology and research, it takes a pastor five to seven years to finally be accepted as a pastor. Five to seven years. It's hard to see. <laughs> oh, Amanda, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> it's I guess I did for I already accepted you, and I knew you for three days. Oh. <laughs> It's hard to see somebody as a pastor. Trust is earned, and it takes time, especially when a community has been wounded. I think that Jairus, of all people leading groups, would have known this, that it takes time for people to see somebody as a leader of the group. But it also is very disappointing when you see somebody with amazing gifts and talents that go unused, unwelcomed, because they do it differently. <coughs> Jairus, he knew how groups work, the dynamics, the complexities, the layers. But one day, he made a choice to believe in a man that he hardly knew. And at the end of the days of our own lives, we have to make that choice too. We may not know everything about God. We may not know everything about Jesus. But what we do know about God is he did not create death. He created us to live. So go, people of God, and live like disciples. Amen? Amen. Amen.